We are uh, delighted to have Diana Marquis with us and Professor uh, Robert Holland um, from uh, the Center of Hellenic Studies at King's College. He's going to introduce the author and to talk about the book. There are books. There are two books at the entrance there. For those of you who haven't bought them, they're available. Uh, and uh, do please buy them if you would like to have one of this evening's uh, event. And also, there is another book that uh, we would like you to, to write your um, uh, comments about this event or, or previous events. So that's all. I'm not going to say anything else. Welcome again. And let's welcome Professor Holland. Now, I think the, the um, I should say I'm going to talk for about 25 minutes. And more interestingly, Diana is going to talk for, I think, about um, two hours. So. <laughs> So uh, you will have an entertaining evening. I think uh, it'll be about one hour, the whole thing, and then we can have questions. And now I believe there is some, um, perhaps there's a drink afterwards to be more relaxing. Um, I think the most interesting thing about going to any um, book launch is at least as much, at least as much about seeing and hearing the author as it is about um, uh, the book itself. And so I think it's right I should say something about um, Diana Marquides, even though, of course, some of you know her very well and some of you know of her, but not everybody. And it's particularly appropriate to do so, I think, because Diana is, in a rather special sense, an uh, um, Anglo-Cypriot. I should stand still, shouldn't I? Um, she is uh, Anglo in origin and provenance, as we're about to say, and sort of in style, I think, as well but um, profoundly Cypriot, I think, also by, by long experience. Now, Diana's father, um, if um, I get the full names right, Bert, Bertram John Weston, um, first arrived in Cyprus in 1931, maybe late 1930, I'm not sure about the exact date, but just in time, ironically, for photos of the Octovriana <coughs> surge in later in that year, in October 1931, to appear in the Western family album. At a time when the colonial administrative service, back in those days, was increasing its professional and technical staff, he was appointed, in fact, as a horticulturalist, um, and specifically as a citrus expert, and indeed he was trained in South Africa. Um, John Weston's own father, Diana's grandfather, had been head gardener at Chatsworth. Um, so planting horticulture was presumably in the blood. And indeed, to digress slightly, the Chatsworth-based Duke of Devonshire had been secretary for state in the, of the, for the colonies in the mid-1920s. And the suspicion is that the Duke um, may well have played a role in encouraging the head gardener's newly married young son to head east young man. Anyway, Chat Cyprus via Chatsworth seems to have been the fate of the Western family. Later on, Diana's father, I think uniquely in the history of the colonial government of Cyprus, served as commissioner in every district up until 1960. And indeed on Sunday, 1st of March, 1959, he was the first government official designated to board the plane from Athens and welcome Archbishop Makarios back home after his exile. This perhaps says something too about the local Cypriot appreciation of Diana's father. He had a particular affection, I think it's true to say, for Famagusta, uh, and one German scholar writing about um, uh, B.J. Weston, uh, uh, and Famagusta, this is on the web, but I don't know if Diana's seen it, refers to her father's vision of Cyprus as a Switzerland of the Eastern Mediterranean. And the conclusion um, by this scholar is that this vision was outdated by the 1950s, but I would guess that for many the ideal, or some variant thereof, would be rather attractive, would it not, in the 21st century. But I hope it's so, you know, uh, a few minutes wasted or not wasted, spent in sketching the family background, but I think uh, you're, you're, it's relevant to what we'll be discussing later on. 
Diana was therefore brought up, partly, in the island during the 1950s. Um, and some of her friends of that time are here tonight. Uh, the first years of independence, I was mostly in London uh, and that other rowdy territory, Scotland, but returned in 1967, married Sophocle Marquides, St. Andrew's trained, and to this day, when not in Cyprus, can often be found roaming the glens. And she was soon working with a Swedish contingent of Umfisia. She was an originator of the British Residence for Justice in Cyprus organization after 1974, and was a leading light in what became its subsequent offshoot, um, the Women's Walk Home movement. Again, some people involved in that are here tonight, active on and on, off and on through to the later 19. Ages. Diana's paid employment relating to the translation of Greek press articles for Umfisip in the later 1970s helps to account for her um, excellent Greek language. Now, all of this is just by way of saying that Diana is somebody, is somebody obviously profoundly grounded in Cypriot events during most of her lifetime. Now, Diana's emergence as an academic historian, so here we come through to the academic phase of things, stemming in some ways from her labours at the UN, also needs some comment. When I first met her, by now it's 1991, she was just completing a master's degree in history at the University of Warwick. And her doctorate in the University of London um, became her first well-known book, on sale tonight, as we'll repeat, um, entitled Cyprus 1957-63, From Colonial Conflict to Constitutional Crisis, The Key Role of the Municipal municipalities issue. If I've got any regret about that, it's uh, the long title. Um, she and I subsequently produced a volume, also slightly too long, The British and the Hellenes Struggles for Mastery in the Eastern Mediterranean, 1850-1960, in 2006, launched in this hall too, and from that comes her interest um, in large part in Crete and the Dodecanese. Now, afterwards, at various times, Diana has been a fellow, research fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, uh, and she's taught and lectured at the University of Cyprus, and uh, I think elsewhere. Now, amidst all these activities, including familial um, um, duties, we should call them duties, um, she has developed a um, research preoccupation with the tribute question, the old Ottoman tribute in Cyprus, its continuing burden on Cypriots after 1878, during the early decades of the British administration. And the publication we're discussing tonight is um, a staging post, really, on, to, on the way to what will be a, you know, a, bigger, a bigger book. And certainly the one of the big gaps in the literature is on the tribute. So what, coming to the book itself, is distinctive um, about Central in Cyprus, 1892 to 1898, a governor in bondage. First off, there is its is, is accessibility um, to the reader. I mean, a large proportion of academic books, as many of you will know, um, are inaccessible and frequently, indeed, incomprehensible in their use of, um, in their um, constipated use of the English language. And it's why I think biography has become such a popular form. Um, often the only place where you can find on any particular subject um, real history that you can actually understand. And Diana's new book does show how through a biographical um, approach, a historical context can be made tangible and understandable to lay readers. It's an entertaining read. It's an entertaining read. Uh, as good for a bus or a beach as for a, um, a library desk, and, and I do recommend it simply as, a, as I say, something that is very pleasurable to go through. In book reviews, and I think this crackling sound is probably because I'm moving around, you must forgive me, I'm very uh, mobile. In book reviews, it's often said by way of compliment that a volume um, fills a gap in the literature. What a tedious phrase, always in academic period, fills a gap in the literature. Well, this volume does a lot more than simply fills a gap in the literature. In recent decades, there's been a lot of um, writing on the later period of British rule in Cyprus, especially on the 1950s, but also increasingly on the 1930s and 1940s. 
but broadly speaking, in reading about Cyprus in those decades, we're dealing with an island in terms of its political preoccupations, mentalities, that we can still readily recognise from our own day. Um, I mean, the picture on the whole is, you know, fits with our preconceptions and even with our, you know, different prejudices uh, uh, that people retain to, 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 even to today. But those earlier pre-1914 years, by contrast, have been largely ignored other than as a certain kind of folk history or as a cursory prelude to discussing what happened after 1918 or after 1945. And it is, in fact, a bit disorientating to go back to a period seemingly not so very ancient, um, but where our bearings go slightly haywire, and disturbingly where our easy stereotypes don't fit quite so conveniently as we thought they should do, or as we expected. And Central in Cyprus, I think, will open up and make more credible for us, more graspable to us, this pre-1914 era in shaping the post-Ottoman future of Cyprus, and which, and this is the important thing, has a very curious combination of the familiar and the very unfamiliar from a contemporary perspective. So in what way does Diana's new book show that this was a truly transformative era? Um, the book provides all kinds of glimpses of an island society becoming alert to the outside world, outside reference points and connections in new ways. And simultaneously, and again, this is the key thing to me, developing a new public consciousness culture within the island. Whether it be new steamer services to Alexandria and Athens and lots of other places, Cypriots seeking their education abroad, um, the growth of a middle class politics as elected members to the legislature started to be active in a way they weren't in the, 1980, in, in, in the 1880s. And indeed, Sendel himself lobbied hard for Cypriots also to be appointed to the executive council as they eventually were, or say new legislation ensuring antiquity stayed in Cyprus. This is, of course, a period of the growth of the Cyprus Museum. In all those sorts of ways, we are given a practical sense of how a new modernity expressed itself, and Sendel was involved in that. And indeed, in reading her book, I was reminded of another book launch in this hall last year, Costas Yogu's British Colonial Architecture in Cyprus. Many of you may have come to that one highlighting how sweeping were the social and psychological effects of new town planning and residential construction and house styles in the island after 1878. And one question in the audience on that night um, got up and said they hadn't realised that anything had actually changed in the island between 1878 and 1960. <laughs> well, I mean, a very great deal changed in Cyprus in those years. And uh, Diana's book shows how already in the 1890s, um, the society was experiencing exponential shifts relative to what came before. And that is, of course, the only way you can measure change meaningfully. Diana's book has a particular resonance in um, another fashion. Cyprus has a written up political history, but very little real economic or fiscal or financial history. And the trouble is, the one without t'other doesn't always make a great deal of sense or limited sense. And the bondage in the title um, refers to um, Sendall's battles, financial battles, with the stingy British Treasury. And if there is a demon in Diana's account, of course, it is um, this latter Whitehall department, which is, of course, used not to being loved by anybody. But another bondage comes implicitly into the story, and that is the way that Cypriot farmers, by the end of the 18th, uh, 19th century, um, with a growing surplus of carrots or potatoes or uh, wheat, whatever it was, had become exposed, certainly on a weekly or monthly or regular basis, to the ups and downs of market prices, set inevitably outside the island. And the new public consciousness referred to was in part a reflection of a consciousness of the ups and downs of prices and wages and incomes and therefore of course of prosperity and welfare. It's a sad fact that the downside of uh, becoming a little bit more wealthy, as Cyprus certainly was, however poor, in this period, invol invariably involves less certainty, more anxiety. And ordinary Cypriots were painfully finding this out in the 1890s, a decade of worldwide commodity slump. Places as diverse as New Zealand and Argentina also suffered badly, and indeed worse than Cyprus, because they were more 
mature as economies. And a bit more wealth also involves a bit more taxation. And if Sendell hit his head against the brick wall of the British Treasury, he also came up against the equally obstinate refusal of the Cypriot bourgeoisie and the property-owning classes to pay extra taxes. What else is new? To buy social goods. Be they better bridges, more bridges, more pool facilities, or crucially, irrigation. If only we could Egypt Cyprus, Sendell is quoted by Diana as saying, by which he meant to replicate what was seen then as a great achievement of Lord Cromer's Egypt in making agriculture profitable, um, irrigable, and putting the country's finances into sustainable shape. Again, in all such ways, Diana's book starts to explore the real friction points of Cypriot political economy in the period, and any larger history of the tribute which she's going to produce will inevitably have to do that even more fully. But perhaps the central conundrum um, of Sendl in Cyprus is more crudely and straightforwardly political, because here we have a very odd and puzzling phenomenon indeed. That is a locally popular British governor, popular, and indeed a governor's wife, the dedicated and charitable Lady Sophia. And sometimes you have to rub your eyes with disbelief. A governor who, on returning from leave, uh, was met by a welcoming party in Larnaca, a welcoming party, who had a budding friendship, yes, a, a friendship with the abbot of Kika. And the most remarkable image for me in many ways, there are many remarkable images in the book, but that of when Sandal convened a legislative council <laughs> at the monastery um, in August 1897, and the events and the party that took place on that occasion. Um, um, who, um, uh, something of a classicist himself, encouraged Hellenic education and helped set up Greek schools. And who um, was finally lauded in a farewell ceremony. The smiling abbot was there too on 31st of December 1897 in none other than the Fanna Romney Girls School in Nicosia, when none other than the Archbishop Sophronius unveiled a plaque in honour of um, in honour of Sendl. So this past really is another country. And it's another country still more fundamentally that it was an island which, far from most Greek Cypriots wanting the British to leave, protested warmly when apparently they seemed to have no intention of staying. Or more precisely, when it was rumoured, all the more worrying because the Royal Navy hardly ever made an appearance in Cypriot waters, um, uh, um, that rumoured that the small army garrison, an army garrison of Connell Rangers up at Polymethia, was about to be withdrawn. And mention of the Connell Rangers reminds us too that the British Empire, even in its mini Cypriot version, was always a quintessentially Irish as much as it was an English, Scottish or Welsh institution. In the event, the Rangers, who knew the island well after 1878 and were crucial in coping with the deadly flood in Limassol in 1894, were withdrawn, and only a token garrison of 100 troops were left. A force that remained minuscule for years thereafter, at least up until 1931, and really beyond that. This then, the Cyprus of the 1890s that Diana describes, is clear, clearly a radically different island in disposition and perceptions and texture from that of the 1920s onwards. The forms of which, however, are too easily um, read back and transposed onto the earlier period in the received wisdom of school textbooks, public history, including CYBC. The reasons for the contrast are obvious enough and nicely traced in Diana's book. Greek Cypriots at the end of the 19th century had a canny sense of the threats and possibilities still surrounding them and an, aware, an, an awareness that the British presence offered protection that couldn't likely be um, done without at the time. It was only later that the risk assessment shifted subtly, and much later gave way entirely, perhaps in ways, though this is my remark, not Diana's, that was a bit less surely in touch with the realities and threats around them than the appreciation of the generation of the 1890s. The key point, however, is that the island over which Sandal resided was one which still had multiple futures, possibilities in front of it, where the connection with Britain still had ways, uh, uh, 
uh, still had the capacity to evolve in stable and gradual terms, where Greeks and Turks still had many commonalities as well as differences, not least over money, and where there was still everything to play for at many levels. Later, the range of possibilities was to narrow markedly, though of course the responsibility for that could be shared in all kinds of directions. And it's in that spirit that when Diana and Ruth Kashishian, the um, publisher of Mouflon, asked me to add a postscript to Central in Cyprus, I contributed the fragment on the, the back of the book stating that the principal enjoyment of it was simply to have narrated in rich detail that once upon a time in Cyprus, such a world existed. And that's how I feel about it. Because looking back from today, at least, it presents a surprising, awakening kind of world with naturally many blemishes and anxieties and still a very much an ingrained poverty, but yet without those searing discontents um, that affected judgments and distorted relationships between British and Cypriots, and more importantly, between different kinds of Cypriots, indeed, different kinds of Greek Cypriots, as much as between Greeks and Turks. And something in me, at least, when you read the book, and particularly when you get to the end of the book, would like to have this world back, if only for a moment, to reconfigure the future that was finally to emerge from its chrysalis, and perhaps to allow, albeit in some different form, the Switzerland of the Eastern Mediterranean that moved Diana's father. But whatever your particular viewpoint may be, this is a book, and it's got lovely, uh, really got delightful illustrations, that anybody who loves Cyprus from inside or outside will enjoy purely because it conjures up, I think, the flavour of the island in a new and very unexpected kind of form. So um, let me stop there, I think, and, and, and let Diana herself speak for what is, after all, her own book, but only to repeat what Agatha has already said, that um, um, both Diana's earlier book on the municipalities and perhaps the most importantly of all this book is on sale at an excellent discount at the back of the at the back of the room. But thank you very much for listening, and uh, let me let me hand over to Diana. Um, thank you very much, Rob, for that wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book too, but also how I came to write it. I think though first I should thank the Hellenic Centre. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I'd like to thank the Hellenic Centre for providing us with such a warm and hospitable venue. And most particularly I'd like to thank its director, Agathe Galispera, for making all the arrangements. Uh, especially for the glasses of wine that we're all going to enjoy at the end, I believe. I'm, of course, extremely privileged to have anyone as distinguished an authority as Professor Holland presenting the book here. He's already touched on the fact that we've worked very closely on the subject of broader Anglo-Greek relations, and of course you can't do that without working on Anglo-Turkish relations as well. The two are inextricably intertwined, especially when it comes to Cyprus. Uh, so it seems most appropriate to me that he should be introducing you to this work of mine on the extraordinary relations between one particular British governor and the Cypriots, a vignette, if you like, of the 1890s in Cyprus. Uh, Rob has also touched on, on the fact that I met him when he was writing what has for many years now been the seminal authority on the subject of Britain and the revolt in Cyprus in the 1950s. And he has in fact been my mentor only regarding historiography ever since. So, how did I come to write this book? In fact, it was Rob Holland's colleague, Peter Lyon, who warned me years ago that in order to get right round a subject, in order to understand the broader picture, chronologically, regionally, you first have to get right inside it. And that if you don't, you're liable to oversimplify and draw inaccurate conclusions, and this happens more often than not. So I've always followed this advice. It can take rather longer to produce a book, but it's worth getting right inside it so that you understand the broader picture better. And this is what I was doing, getting right inside the bigger subject of the tribute that uh, Rob has already mentioned. 
when I became so struck with the Sendel years, the last decade of the 19th century, years which had actually hardly been touched in Cypriot historiography. It's a very important story, I think, and that nobody knew much about, so I decided it was worth a book on its own, and here it is. Sir Walter Joseph Sendel was the fourth High Commissioner of Cyprus. They were called High Commissioners as long as Cyprus was uh, a province of the Ottoman Empire. And I've been aware of him for some many years, actually, and found him intriguing. I first came across him when working on Nicosia during British rule, a very long time ago. He'd been referred to by one or two local historians as taking an interest in local education, but that was about it. Then, in the entrance to Fano Romani Girls' School, if I can find the right button, I found this. This isn't a very good slide, but it gives you an idea. Uh, Fano Romani Girls' School is in the heart of Old Nicosia, and this is an inscription to Sir Walter Sendel, a great High Commissioner of Cyprus and a great friend of learning. There it was, in a Greek school which was at the heart of the anti-colonial struggle at the end of British rule. After some inquiry, I discovered that this modern plaque had replaced an older dedication that had disappeared during the 1950s, not being politically correct. Then, some years later, whiling away the time in the National Portrait Gallery, I came across this right in the middle of room 23, expansion and empire. There he was, in the middle of the room, an imposing bust by Edward Lantry of Sir Walter Sendel. He'd not only distinguished himself in Cyprus, but in Ceylon and the West Indies, and it was the, the, from the West Indies that this uh, bust derived. Uh, the book has been described as a biography, and that's how uh, Rob described it a little while ago, but it definitely is not only about a colonial governor. It's as much about Cypriots. These Cypriots. And these Cypriots. And problems they had during those, those years, and how they were tackled in an unusually close collaboration between governor and governed, and that's what's really special about Sandal, the way he collaborated with the Cypriots. The, this collaboration is epitomized in 1897 by an extraordinary event that uh, Rob was already referred to. The Legislative Council, sorry, uh, a colonial semi-elected legislature, usually met here in the Secretariat the hub of the colonial government. And there was not without, this, this particular venue was not without its symbolism. There was an element of control. The government was all around. Uh, but in 1897, they met, as you've already heard, right up here, high in the Papos forest, in the, uh, the monastery of the Abbot of Kiko, the Abbot of Kiko being one of the elected members of the Legislative Council. It was a unique event, never happened again. But to find out why it happened and how it happened, you have to read the book. So these and other contemporary photographs are beautifully presented in the book, thanks to the skill and determination of our graphic designer, who is Marsha Dallas, who's in Cyprus, so she's not with us tonight. But contemporary photographs of that period are few and far between. But I was lucky enough to have Thelma Blatchford, Blatchford as a friend and a proofreader. She and I go back a long way, and she's been working with me on texts for years. But this time, she's done much more. Her wonderful drawings, which you'll see when you read the book. Uh, when we couldn't find a contemporary photograph of a building that came into the story, she'd pick up her sketch pad, go off to the building and draw it, or draw an impression of it. And this is the government printing office, uh, which is opposite the Secretariat. It's built in 1896. Actually, it's being restored at the moment, so it might never look quite like that again. But you should go and have a look when you're next in Nicosia. And this is an impression of the Rushtier Idadi 
Muslim school for Muslim boys, which was built at exactly the same time. And if you can't tell from this impression, but if you see both buildings, you can see that they have a great deal in common. Sendal, uh, it was the Muslim boys' school was built at Sendal's insistence, so he wasn't only worrying about Greek education or Christian education, but also about the education of, of Muslims. But also, Thelma sketched farm implements. You can actually see original, the original farm implements in the folk museum of the village of Ficardu, which is a wonderful village just south of Nicosia, and it's well worth a visit. You can go around the folk museum there and see the actual uh, implements that Thelma drew. But why are farm implements important to this story? Here's another one. Um, revenue. They had to do with revenue. Sendall spent a great deal of his only home leave in London lobbying for Cyprus. When he was interviewed by a paper called the Westminster Budget, he took with him little wooden carvings of Cypriot farm implements to show the very basic tools with which Cypriots cultivated the land and produced the crops. But these crops were what the government depended on very largely for revenue. And the management of revenue and public debt were a key part of this story. It was Sendall's wooden carvings that led Thelma to draw these wonderful impressions of the simple homemade tools which were in the final analysis the main source of revenue. The underlying cause of the local administration's difficulties was the fact that a large portion of, of the island's annual revenue was used, um, <coughs> had been bailed in, to use a fashionable modern word, uh, to pay part of the Ottoman public debt. This was not just a Cypriot phenomenon. After Ottoman bankruptcy in 1875, the Europeans had scrambled to secure their massive investments in the Sultan's domains. And in Cyprus, this meant that the funds to be spent on the island were very limited. And that the treasury in London kept an iron grip on how every penny was spent. Graphic example, Sendal had to apply to the colonial office in London in order to allow the provision of fodder for a second horse, badly needed by one of his police commandants. So the application would be passed to the treasury, from the colonial office to the treasury, and then back to the colonial office. And given the slow communications of the period, if permission were granted at all, it wouldn't come for months. Imagine trying to administer an island in that situation. What Sandal did about, about it is a big part of this story. In fact, if you've been wondering why I chose the title, The Governor in Bondage, se sexy title, you might think, um, I was using his own words, and, and this is what he said, writing to the permanent secretary at the colonies, who was a close friend, Robert Mead, his name was. The government of Cyprus is an interesting post, but it has many drawbacks, not least of which is that owing to the bondage under which we live to the treasury, the position of the governor is most disheartening and in a sense humiliating. This is strong language, but I'm quite prepared to justify it and it is a subject on which I could say a great deal if you wished that I should do so. Another thread running through this narrative is the series of anomalies created by the continuing Ottoman status of the island. Remember that Cyprus was not actually made a crown colony until 1925. Uh, so it was still an Ottoman province run by a British colonial administration and they had great trouble in cohabiting with this Ottoman status. So that's another theme that runs through this book that hasn't been touched much by anyone else. A natural consequence of this balancing act was the importance of tolerating cultural diversity in order to maintain tranquility within the island, in order to maintain tranquility within the region. Maintaining tranquility in order to maintain the status quo or maintaining the status quo in order to maintain tranquility, two sides of the same coin, was a regional concern. And here is where we see the detailed situation in the island having, uh, the same, uh, having an impact on what was happening in the broader region. 
uh, this need to maintain tranquility in order to maintain the status quo was at the heart of the Eastern question, which was at this time once more beginning to threaten European peace, and of course would subsequently fail and we would uh, fall into the First World War. So parallels are drawn in the book with similar efforts by the European powers led by Britain, the leading naval power of the region, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and particularly in Crete uh, a few years later, when it became a European protectorate of sorts. So demonstrations of anarchist sentiment beginning at about this time, this is a demonstration in Limassol in 1895, were tolerated. Um, but the difference with, between this kind of demonstration and demonstration in years to come was they, they were the result of rumours that the British were about to withdraw from the island, not a demand for their withdrawal. The great fear at this time, and it was a really very real fear of the Christians on the island, was that they would be returned to the direct, direct Ottoman rule if the British left, so that when the Connaught Rangers that Rob mentioned were actually getting onto their boat to leave. Uh, the Cypriots felt this was the beginning of, of the real evacuation and um, got out in numbers to demonstrate, uh, not exactly against them leaving, uh, but to say that if they were to leave, we are part of, we want to be part of the Greek world. We don't want to get back to the Ottomans. And this is when you start, there, a little friction begins, and you'll see this in the book, with the Muslim community who try to prevent these demonstrations from happening. For the same reason, uh, I was going to say, sorry, this part of this balancing act, allowing this kind of demonstration, uh, was balanced, if you like, by making sure that the Ottoman status of the island was underlined, so that on the, on the Sultan's birthday, cannons would be fired. And Cypriot merchantmen continued to put to sea, flying the Turkish flag right up until the First World War. It was very important to Britain and to Europe, to stability in the region, that uh, the island went on being a Turkish island. And this is also true of Crete. If you'd like to read the other book, which isn't actually here, but you can get on Amazon, Britain and the Hellenes, it's called. Uh, struggles for mastery. Okay. So, for, this, for the same reason, education, which Sendel did a great deal to promote and expand, continued to be communal, continued to be Greek and Turkish. To, to attempt to impose the English language on either community would have created resentment and reaction in both. And remember that that holy grail that uh, people, are, that the, the government is looking for in the island and in the region is tranquility. This didn't mean, of course, that the Cypriots didn't combine against the government when their common interest required it. In 1893, arguing for the need for Cypriots to be represented in the Executive Council, I believe Rob touched on that as well. Uh, this is something that, that Sendel did, which was very advanced. He wanted Cypriots to take part in the highest decision-making body, the cabinet, if you like, and he, yeah, he did achieve it. Uh, so, in arguing that this should happen, in arguing to London that this should happen, he reported to the Secretary of State, who was Lord Ripon at the time, and I'm quoting, the two races conduct themselves with a remarkable harmony in the Legislative Council. I believe at the time when it was constituted on its present footing, it was thought probable that the two races would oppose each other and that government, by reason of such opposition, would be able to rule both. Any such conception has proved entirely fallacious. The two races are united in solid opposition to the government. This was mostly about taxes, but not only. So, Sendel's untiring efforts for the island in very difficult circumstances remain at the heart of this book. He is everywhere looking for ways forward. And these efforts are much appreciated by the Cypriots. So that in June 1897, when the British Empire was celebrating Queen Victoria's jubilee with great pomp and ceremony. A small detachment of Cypriot Zaptias, policemen, even went to London with their own horses, 
so that they would be shown to best effect. Um, and took part in the stunning summer ceremonies that were going on here at the time. And in Cyprus, there was an extraordinary and spontaneous, Sandal's words, outburst of loyalty. And listen to this description and try and imagine what a different place it was to the, to the Cyprus of later years. This is the anniversary of Queen Victoria's, uh, Queen Victoria's Jubilee, 50 years. At this, this is uh, Sendel's, uh, Sendel's letter. At the service in the morning, the Fanaromani church and the adjacent streets were filled to overflowing. The English national anthem was sung in Greek words and the service concluded with enthusiastic vivats for Her Majesty. I drove through the streets in an open carriage and nothing could exceed the enthusiasm of the orderly crowd with which they were thronged. I mean, Think about what happened afterwards. And judging from the absence of jubilation at past and future, future royal anniversaries, this was a tribute to Sendel himself, rather than the government in London, and a message to that government. The Cypriots tried hard to persuade London to let Sendel stay on, and at the end of 1897, he was due to leave in 1890, the beginning of 1898, Petitions poured into Whitehall from every town, virtually every village in the island. You can actually see them in the files, all these petitions with Mukhtar's stamps and mayor's stamps and so on, um, asking, begging Queen Victoria to allow him to be reappointed. And here is the petition, petition sent by the leaders of the um, Christian and Muslim communities together from the Mejli Idari. I think that's very impressive. Uh, if you look at, if you, when you read the book, you can see exactly what it says. And if you're interested, I can later, later read it to you. But I'm not going to say any more about the book until you've read it, then perhaps we can get together and have another discussion. I want to say two more thank yous though. One to Ruth of Mouflon Publications for bearing with me through all the loops that we had to negotiate to get this book out. And to her editor, Ian Todd. And last but definitely not least, my family, none of whom are here, I'm afraid, but I have to mention them. <laughs> my children and their families who long had to put up with my other bookish life. And this book is actually dedicated to my two children, Christina and Ian. And of course, last but not least, my long-suffering husband, who isn't here either, Sophocles. <laughs> I know he's very glad to finally see Sendel launched and drifting on in full sail. S a l e please um, over the horizon so i suggest we have a glass of wine and wish him a good journey thank you very much